So for our theme that we've been looking at, praying and believing, lex aronde, lex credende, what we pray is what we believe, we've looked at the foundations of early Christian prayer in its, in its early context. Uh, we looked at that the very first session. Uh, then Father Duane, you'll recall, did uh, two, over two weeks, uh, looked at the basics of the Mass and the scriptural and historical foundations of the Mass. Father Peter did a presentation last week on the Roman Missal. So I feel like we, we really got an ex some excellent presentations on the Mass. And today I want to turn our attention in this theme of, of praying what we believe is to look at the beginnings, the establishment, uh, sort, of, sort of the historical evolution, if you will, of, of a creed, the creed that we recite as the Nicene Creed primarily, but we'll be talking about, of course, the Apostles' Creed as well. So I want, I want to talk about today the authoritative, now listen to all these words, authoritative, formal, <laughs> fundamental statement I believe, I believe, which is, of course, uh, in Latin, credo, I believe, uh, the first words of both the Apostles and the Nicene Creed. So I mentioned the word authoritative, and one of the reasons, I have to tell you that one of the reasons that I really enjoy teaching uh, in this particular kind of setting is that I get to talk about authority from the perspective of of, of true authority. I don't have to talk about it as being a relative authority, as being something that is, a, that is a, an ancient construct that we don't have any use for anymore in our world. So I really get to talk about it, because uh, we've spent some time in here looking at the word authority in, in adult faith formation, particularly over the last year, as we looked at those foundations of the sacred scripture and sacred tradition as being authoritative for us. And so uh, today, again, we'll be looking at that authority. It's such a central concept to our Catholic faith. Uh, I think especially when we live in a world out there that will tell you that, that you are your own authority, uh, which is increasingly, of course, the message of this age. So hopefully, um, feel free to check out of the world for the next little bit, and, uh, and we'll talk about that. So by what authority do we say these words, I believe, those words in the creed. By what authority do we say them? And, and by that I mean when we say those words, by what authority has that structure, that statement, that formal compilation uh, been given to us? Uh, by what authority? And do we have the authority to change it? Do we have the authority to say that we believe something else or that we would change words? And there's an unfortunate point in our history where we did something like that, not change, but an addition I'm going to talk about. For instance, um, you know, and, and I do, I frequently get asked to speak at other churches. I mean, in my, in my secular job, right, I teach Christian church history. So it's not uncommon for me to be asked to speak in various kinds of, of denominations and congregations. And I won't name this denomination that invited me, but it was recently, and I was invited to talk about the creeds. They wanted to hear about the creeds of Christianity. And when, um, and forgive me if some of you may have already heard this story, but after I had given this presentation and had passed out to everyone a copy of the the, the Nicene, Constantinople, and Creed, because it's actually two councils that, that do this, uh, I, I had this look of confusion on lots of faces in the room. And, and somebody said, this is nothing like the Creed that we say. And so I was curious, because I've been invited to speak as a historian about Christian creeds. <laughs> and what had happened is that this particular uh, denomination had taken the Nicene Creed and put it in 21st century language, language that they felt was appropriate um, to speak about God, not as father, but as, as in genderless language. Um, and, and I have to tell you, it was, nothing, it was nothing I would have recognized. So 
so again, coming back to this, this issue of authority, because at the very core of our Christian faith, our, our faith as Catholics, is based in these two words, uh, I believe. Uh, so I think, I think, again, a really important thing to remember when we say today that we are Catholic. Can we take just a moment to review? If we could take just a moment to review about the word. What do we say we are when we say we are Catholic? Right, so that, that word in the Greek, katos holos, or according to the whole, was first used uh, in the late first, perhaps, turn of the second century uh, in a series of letters that St. Ignatius of Antioch was writing on his way to Rome to be fed to the lions. Okay? Which is a whole other point I often like to make, is that we should always remember that our faith as it was delivered to us by these early saints and martyrs, this faith is bloodstained. It is not ours to change. And, and that they paid for the truth with their lives. And so St. Ignatius of Antioch writes this letter. One of these letters, he says, uh, these words, loosely translated, is wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. And the term he uses there is in the Greek, katos holos, according to the whole. So we're talking, obviously, about a universal principle, a universal communion of people who are united by a common belief in Jesus Christ. Wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. And I would argue that that is an early creed. That's an early form of a creed. Just those basic words uh, themselves constitute a statement of belief. So when we say we are Catholic, we acknowledge that we are part of the universal faith. And to be Catholic calls us to unity. For a cry, for, remember, in Christ, there is completeness, there is unity, uh, and nothing is divided. So, unity demands this common, shared understanding of what it is that we believe, and that in the historical and human circumstances of that is where we get our creeds. Is out of that framework of a need for a common understanding. And I mentioned, you know, today I, I probably will focus mostly on the Nicene Constantinople Creed. We usually just abbreviate it and call it the Nicene Creed. But we're going to talk a little bit about the Apostles' Creed as well, uh, a little bit about that. So I mentioned that maybe, you know, when St. Ignatius of Antioch, when he's making his, his journey to his martyrdom, uh, that those words, in fact, probably constitute an early creed. Wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. Uh, are there earlier creeds? I mean, there, when we think about what a creed is, to say, I believe, is a statement of belief. It's a profession of belief. So there are earlier examples of that. Well, what about creeds in the Bible? Is the creed in the Bible... Have you, had, have you ever had well-intentioned non-Catholic friends ask you that? Now, not mainstream Protestants, because mainstream Protestants use the Nicene Creed. Um, well, it, it can sometimes in contemporary language, apparently. But, uh, but, but yes, they, they do use the Nicene Creed. They recognize the authoritative nature of it as a, as a profession of belief. But are there, uh, are, are there earlier creeds? And I, and I do hear this sometimes. Uh, particularly, remember I, what I teach, medieval Europe and Christian church history, uh, the, there, I teach very few Catholics. There are actually very few mainstream Protestants today. So I often find myself having to teach like the very basics of what is a creed, where this came from, the circumstances out of which it came from, because 90% of even Christian students in, in the Bible Belt here don't know the creed. They don't know the Nicene Creed. Some of them have never heard of it. And so I frequently get asked, well, where is it in the Bible? Show me where it is in the Bible, and maybe I could believe it. Right? And so then it's a process of sitting down and looking at, well, this is what the creed says. Is there anything here you disagree with? Well, no. But where is it in the Bible? Okay, I get that a lot. So, um, and remember that, that I think this is important too, the whole... 
context is helpful to know that the Nicene Creed was forged before the canon of Scripture was formally closed at the Council of Carthage in 397. So the, the creed, uh, the, the first version or, the, or the, the, the first part of the version of the creed is finalized at Nicaea in 325, but there are additions made, expanded language given to it at the Council of Constantinople in 381, 56 years later. So the, the canon of scripture, all the books of the Bible that were agreed upon as authoritative and could be included in the canon, that's not closed until 397. So in many ways, for me, it's always been, you know, and think back to what I said the very first class when we talked about prayer in its earliest Christian context. I think I even said the words, we were praying what we believed before we had written down what we believed and before we had put those books together of, of the, the 66 canonical books of the Bible. So we were believing from the very beginning and praying that belief from the very beginning. But it's a process. It's a process. So that's, that's an important point I think we have to remember when people say, well, where is the creed in the Bible? Well, where was the Bible when there was a creed? Yeah. That's sort of my response to that. Where was the Bible when we were writing, formalizing the creed? So, you know, the symbol, if you want to think about, about a creed as being a statement or, or words, that's great. But there are also, of course, symbols that can be creedal, right? I mean, simple things for which, for early Christians, was a statement of belief, right? So what is the earliest secret symbol of Christianity? Fish. The ichthus, right, the fish, right, this fish symbol, the ichthus. Uh, well, remember, you know, I asked, Y'all did really good, because when I ask that of college students, the cross, you know, it's always the answer is the cross. Well, no, because to have worn a cross, or to have used a cross, uh, until crucifixion was outlawed in the 4th century, was sort of be the equivalent of wearing a little electric chair around your neck today. Um, it was the state method of execution would not have been used as, as, a, as a Christian symbol in those early centuries. So, so we have this early Christian symbol of the ichthus, which is itself, of course, an acronym, right? Ichthus in, in, in the Greek stands for the first letters of the words Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. That is a creed, isn't it? And it's, and it's expressed very simply uh, in what we believe to have been a secret symbol. Now, where we get this idea, of course, is that it is in, it's in many um, uh, ancient structures that we believe Christians used. Uh, it's in the graffiti, if you will. And then St. Augustine, uh, writing in the 4th century in the City of God, uh, describes uh, the use of the ichthus as an early Christian symbol, as a secret sign. It was a way that Christians were able to tell each other, if you met someone... If you met some stranger on the road in times of persecution and you didn't know that that person was Christian, you could simply draw one half of the fish, right, in the dirt in front of you. And this, the Christian whom, whom you're facing, if they are in fact Christian and understood the significance of that, could draw the other, simply draw the other half. And you've made a connection, you've communicated your belief without words without words. So clearly that is, I think, a, a beautiful early uh, expression of that. The cross as a symbol is also a statement of belief, of course, uh, in simple visual terms, but obviously profoundly theological terms. To wear a cross, to display a cross is a statement of belief. So there are some places in sacred scripture where one finds very simple professions our declarations of, of faith. Some of these are going to be very obvious, I think, uh, to you. I can't give you an exhaustive list. But I mean, you can even go back into the Old Testament. Look in, for instance, in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. The Lord is our God. That's a creed. 
uh, in uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right? It's a creed. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, further there, uh, in Jesus' great commission, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In his instructions to the apostles, he is giving an early formulary of the Trinity that will be expressed, fully expressed, uh, at Nicaea in 325. In the Gospel of John, remember this scene, Nathaniel answered him, You are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Simon Peter, this is in John, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. It's a creed. And my favorite, of course, again in John's Gospel, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Okay, so to lead up to what I want to talk about first, though, Let's look at something that's in Acts of the Apostles. Okay, now generally, um, the Acts of the Apostles is considered to be the history text, right, of the New Testament. If you think about, uh, not that we cannot give historical weight to the canonical Gospels, or even the non-canonical ones for that matter, not that we don't read those as historical documents. We always have to do so, I think, with caution in any of them, uh, at least in secular history, of course, because, because we, we're... we're we're running into a conflation of history and, and theology of people's encounter with their God. So I always have to be very careful about that in the secular classroom. But Acts of the Apostles, I think, even with secular historians, is generally considered to be a good history. It's a good history of the early church. It's a good history of, of what's going on in those earliest Christian communities, those apostolic communities. And so this particular one, um, I, I really like for that reason, I, and I use it, I can use it here and I can use it on the campus of a state university. This is from the, um, the eighth chapter of Acts. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, y'all will remember this scene, see, here is water. What is to prevent my being baptized? Do y'all remember this scene? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And then what does the eunuch say? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's a creed. It's a creedal statement. So what about baptism? Because that's a great place to begin uh, exploring the historical evolution of the creed. Baptism involved a statement of belief, as you can see, I think, hopefully clearly, from this passage from Acts of the Apostles. We also know this from early formularies that existed uh, for, for the Christians, including something called the Didache, which uh, I mentioned the first... I think the very first uh, session, I know that Father Duane mentioned it, I believe Father Peter mentioned it last week, the Didache being this uh, so-called Lord's Instructions to the Twelve Apostles, that is um, an important, important early source about the Mass and about baptism. Think of it like an instruction manual for how to do church in the first century, because that's what it is. And we're actually gonna explore that much more in just a minute. We also know a lot about baptism from sources outside of Christianity, which is kind of neat. Um, historical documents, for instance, um, that baptism and the Eucharist were the two principal acts of worship in the early church, uh, we actually get from some pagan sources. Uh, his, historians uh, or historical sources within uh, the construct of the Roman Empire writing about the activities of Christians. So during times of persecution, for instance, during times of persecution, there would be people who would tattle to the emperor, right? They'd tattle to the emperor and, uh, emperor and say, this is what I'm observing in my province or in my region. This is what I'm noticing that they're doing. You need to know about these subversive Christians, right? And so one of the greatest sources for that, we have a, we have a series of surviving letters, correspondence between 
a man named Pliny the Younger, who was the governor of Bithynia, an area in northern Turkey, who was writing to the Emperor Trajan. Now Trajan is emperor at the end of the first and into the early, uh, the early second century. Um, I want to say Trajan is emperor between about 96 and 116, 117. So we're talking about that bridge between the, 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 um, the first two centuries of Christianity. And the governor is doing exactly that. He is tattling on Christians. He's tattling. Dear emperor, you're not going to believe what I saw or what I've heard. And it's, it's interesting because he's got spies all over Asia Minor, apparently, who are doing nothing except spending their time monitoring the activities of this subversive group of what I think, because by this point in time, it's apparent that they are a separate sect from Judaism. It makes them all the more suspicious to the Roman authorities. And so, uh, so uh, Pliny writes these letters, and this is what he says. Uh, and, oh, okay, and before, before I quote him, I want, I want to, to give you some other background. I think as Catholics, of course, we are so accustomed to hearing about the intense periods of persecution in the early church. And we know, I, I mean, every, the next time you hear that beautiful Roman canon and you hear that list, right, what comes to my mind always is the blood they spilled. Um, that, that we, we have this, this fresh in our early identity as martyrdom being, you know, it was, um, remember what is it, uh, what is the expression? That um, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So we have this, this notion of, of martyrdom and persecutions. I think sometimes what we miss because of that is that there were periods of toleration too uh, that, that I think are periods that are equally interesting. And this happens to be one of those. The Emperor Trajan responded to the governor of Bithynia by basically calling him a busybody <laughs> and saying, do you have nothing better to do than to monitor these people who aren't hurting anyone? If they are not disturbing the civil order, leave them alone, right? So Pliny shuts up. That's where the correspondence ends, right? But we do have this little snapshot from his tattling uh, from a secular source of what early Christ, uh, what early, the early church was doing, okay? And again, from the standpoint of a historian, this is excellent because it gives us an independent verification outside of Christian sources about what the early church is doing, about what it looked like from someone looking in, perhaps. He mentions, Pliny mentions the ritual of baptism as apparently, he says, quote, this is a, a, a close quote, it is an act of affirming what these Christians believe about Jesus. An act of affirming what they believe about Jesus. Now, he misses the mark a little bit on the Eucharist because he worries, he, he sort of muses to the emperor that this sounds a lot like cannibalism. They're eating flesh and drinking blood. And he was a little alarmed by that. And, and that's basically when Trajan responds to him and says, zip it. We don't need to talk about this anymore. So anyway, the point, the point I wanted to make about that is that baptism is an affirmation, even to the pagan observer of the first, late first century, baptism is an affirmation of something already believed. And so how does one affirm something that you already believe? Other than submit to the act itself, the act of baptism, how does one affirm their belief? So again, the, the history book of the, of the New Testament, the Acts of the Apostles, and these extant sources like Pliny the Younger point to what must have been a public verbal affirmation of some kind that the, the newly baptized was to make. The formula for that corresponding date, the time when Trajan was emperor, was probably found in an early Christian source, okay, which we're going to talk about. 
Now, before we go on, I'm going to show you that this is what, this is what the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us about, about creeds, about the profession of faith. Um, these are the exact words of the Catechism. It tells us generally about the development of the creeds, the profession of faith. Generally, that from the beginning, the apostolic church expressed and handed on her faith in brief formula, normative for all. Brief formula, normative for all. Right? So this tells us, the catechism, the church tells us, in her wisdom tells us, that this is apostolic, that this was a development process, that it was normative, meaning it applied universally across the church, and then... What I want to do is tell you how we got there. Okay, so let's look at the Didache. This is a text, uh, again, you've heard us mention it several times. It is uh, a text that most scholars today believe dates to the late first century. The late first century. And many um, believe that it may have been in use even earlier. Um, that the Didache, although you won't find it in the Bible, okay, but the Didache may have been in wide circulation among early Christian communities before the Gospels were. That it may have been in circulation uh, before the letters of St. Paul. Um, now, the reason th th that's interesting, I, I think you'll see in a minute, there's something that's contained in the Didache that that tells us one of two things about the circulation of the Gospels or about the, uh, the very rapid oral transmission of something that we all know and love um, today. So we'll talk about that in just a second. At least one scholar of antiquity, uh, a man named Raymond Brown, has argued that he believes that the Didache came out of the Council of Jerusalem. The Council of Jerusalem we're talking about that apostolic council when James, of course, the apostle in Jerusalem, uh, would have been technically the first bishop of Jerusalem, uh, in the year, perhaps the year 50, under the leadership of the still living apostles. Okay? So, is it really the Lord's direct instructions to the 12 apostles about how to do church? Um, I can't answer that, but but certainly it has a place in the early in the early uh, period of Christianity, perhaps as early as this second half of the first century. Any early text of the Didache were lost to us. The reason we know that it was authoritative and the reason we know that it was in use is because it's referenced by the fathers. The fathers talk about it. They've seen it. They've read it. Uh, so. It's mentioned uh, not just by people like St. Clement of Alexandria and St. Jerome, you've all heard about, but it's also, you find it, uh, again, uh, is in the 4th century, a man you're going to hear a little more about, about today, uh, Eusebius of Caesarea, who was the, the historian for the Emperor Constantine, wrote an authoritative text on early church history um, called The History of the Church from Christ to Constantine. And in that, uh, that text, Eusebius mentions the Didache. And he talks about the oral tradition of it is that it goes back to the apostles. Okay? So the opening of this, of this text, Didache means two ways. So it opens with describing what the two ways are. Right? There's the way of life and there's the way of death. And we all want to follow the way of life, right? We, right? we do. Well, we all should want to follow the way of life. So the Didache doesn't spend too much time telling you what the way of death is. It tells you what is the way of life. And as I think I might have mentioned in the first uh, session that I did this spring, in the Didache is where you find a complete version of the Lord's Prayer. Now, yes, it's in the Gospel accounts, right, to the Gospel accounts. But why would this be important that it, the full text of it is in the Didache? If it indeed dates to, as Raymond Brown has argued, if it indeed dates to the Council of Jerusalem or began to evolve out of that earliest apostolic community, 
I think that's important because it tells us just how much that prayer was part of the oral tradition of the church. Already. Already the oral tradition uh, of the church. So, about baptism and a profession of faith, the Didache says a lot. Um, in chapter 7 on baptism, it says, quote, Baptize this way, having first said all things, all things. That's how it's translated. <laughs> After having first said all things, baptize into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in living water. Living water. And incidentally, it, the, the, uh, there's, there's a, a further note in chapter 7. This is to be done by full immersion. Okay? So, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in living water. Now, so we have that sort of early beginning of the, the expectation that at baptism, someone to be baptized would recite some affirmation of their belief. And perhaps it was something that simple. I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Perhaps it was that simple. But clearly it is creedal. I believe. Remember what the word means, creed comes from credo. I believe. Credere is actually the Latin verb. All right, so then moving on, when we talk about, um, about the development of what we now know as the Apostles' Creed, there's not a lot of agreement, actually, on the current form of that, uh, when exactly it enters history in that exact form. But I will tell you this. It is early. We believe it is probably based on something called the interrogatory of St. Hippolytus, St. Hippolytus of Rome. Do y'all remember him? Don't you like these test questions I throw at you? Anybody remember St. Hippolytus of Rome? I've got some nods. Who was he? While I take a sip of my coffee, I'm going to ask you to remember... Um, that the first week I showed you a pretty gruesome painting of a man being drawn apart by wild horses. Yeah. And then last, not last week, Father Peter did the Roman Missal last week, the week before that, although Father Peter may have mentioned St. Hippolytus of Rome as well, the Eucharistic, the earliest Eucharistic form. Do you remember Father Duane talking about him, St. Hippolytus? good thing for you, you're not graded. But anyway. <laughs> so, St. Hippolytus of Rome is this second century uh, figure in Rome. Wrote voluminously, prolifically about ritual and ceremony and structure and liturgy and how things were being done. I spoke about him, and I do know Father Duane mentioned him for sure, but obviously he's one of the most prolific writers of this, of this early period from whom we have the earliest surviving Eucharistic prayer that, remember we talked about, you all recognize it? You all recognized it um, when Father Duane shared it to you? I uh, shared it with you. And remember, again, he's the one, as I said, was, was torn apart by wild horses. Um, so the, the little trivia there, of course, is that he's also the patron saint of horses. But anyway, I, I digress. So we're talking about a man who lived between about 170 and 236. And while he is also documenting the, um, the, the Eucharistic prayers that were in use, he's also documenting in writing accounts of baptismal services and gives a formula for it. So this is, what, um, this is what he says. When the person being baptized goes down into the water, he who baptizes him, putting his hand on him, shall say, do you believe in God the Father Almighty? And the person being baptized shall say, I believe. Then holding his hand on his head, he shall baptize him once. And he shall say, Do you believe in Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who was born of the Virgin Mary and was crucified under Pontius Pilate and was dead and buried and rose again on the third day 
alive from dead and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and will come to judge the living and the dead. Does that sound familiar? Okay, so this is early, this is, this is late second century. So we're talking about maybe 190 or, or right about the year 200. And, I, and I'm going to go and continue to quote St. Hippolytus here. He says, and then he says, and when he says, I believe, he is baptized again. And remember, this word, he's trans, we're translating this word <coughs> baptized. The baptism is once. You're doing one baptism. I think the, the better word to have translated this would have been to be immersed. Right. We're not baptizing them again. They're being immersed again. As a matter of fact, I'm going to edit St. Hippolytus. <laughs> <laughs> And when he says, I believe, he is immersed again. And again he shall say, do you believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Church, and the resurrection of the body? The person being baptized shall say, I believe, and then he is immersed a third time. Okay, so this is possibly the formula, the exact formula that was used for the development of the Apostles' Creed. It began as an interrogatory that was used at baptisms. It grew out of that. Uh, and so let's talk about that for a minute because scholars generally agree that what we recite as the Apostles' Creed was developed between the second and fifth or sixth centuries, that it, it, it evolved in its language. But, but I think you see here there's an early version that's very recognizable. It is legend, it is pure legend that the Apostles wrote this creed. That is pure legend. Um, the, the earliest legend about it is that the apostles, and the reason we call it the Apostles' Creed is that the legend was that, um, that the apostles wrote this after Christ's ascension into heaven, um, after having received the Great Commission, that they committed this to tradition then, that this is how it would be done. Uh, that's a legend. I mean, it, it, it's not even considered really tradition of the church. But if it's a great story, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's interesting to consider, and especially when you hear about these New Testament scholars weighing in on, uh, on the Didache, perhaps from dating to the time of the First Council of Jerusalem. Uh, it takes on, I think, another, another dimension to it. We have no reason to question that it's been around in some form for at least that long. So each one of the statements found in the Apostles' Creed can be traced to the apostolic period through either sacred tradition, primarily through sacred tradition, uh, or sacred scripture, but primarily through sacred tradition. So it is quite likely that the earliest written version of the Apostles' Creed is this interrogatory of St. Hippolytus of Rome, who simply wrote down what was being already being orally transmitted. He simply wrote it down. As a matter of fact, um, that's what he's known for, by the way. I think that's an important historical uh, context for understanding him. That's what he's known for, is for documenting what was being done, keeping the record. Uh, he was an enthusiastic documenter. He wrote voluminously. There's lots out there uh, that he left for us. So... Since this interrogatory formula of St. Hippolytus is in fact a summary of Christian doctrine, it is a creed. It is a creed. The term creed is accurate. Um, question and answer format, still a creed. Okay, so then we have something called the rule of faith that's uh, promulgated by a man who was the Bishop of Lyon. Uh, well, then it was Gaul today, of course, France, uh, St. Irenaeus of Lyon in the second century, something called the rule of faith. Uh, now, for those of you that might not be as familiar with St. Irenaeus, um, the towering figure of this early church period, it's probably best known for something he wrote uh, against heresies, it's called Against Heresies, where he, uh, it, it really serves the purpose of, of laying out for us, future generations, all of the heresies that were at work in the early church, these divergent streams of belief that were, he believed had to be suppressed. Uh, but he also uh, leaves us something called the rule of faith. 
Um, and this is when he says, and, 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 and again, let's just remember who he is. Saint Irenaeus of Lyon was a disciple of Saint Polycarp of Smyrna. Okay? Saint Polycarp of Smyrna, Saint Polycarp of Smyrna being um, one of those we call the apostolic fathers, the immediate successors to the apostles. So Saint Irenaeus of Lyon was a disciple of Saint Polycarp of Smyrna. And remember, St. Polycarp of Smyrna was a disciple of the Apostle John. So we are talking about a man who is two generations removed from the immediate, I mean, from the immediate apostolic, the living apostolic age. And so he is also an excellent source for what he writes down. Uh, he's received this, this oral transmission. Even though information on his life is relatively scarce, I think it's fair to say, and in some measure inexact, what we do know is inexact, he's believed to have died about the year 200. And he recorded this rule, and listen to this, this is a quote from this rule of faith of St. Irenaeus of Lyon. This is our faith in one God, the Father Almighty, who created the heaven and the earth and the seas and all the things that are in them. And in one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was made flesh for our salvation. And in the Holy Spirit, who made known through the prophets the plan of salvation. Oops, just lost my place, y'all. Hold on. My iPad, sometimes if I touch it in a certain place, it wants to move me to the end of my document. Um, let's go way back. Okay, way back. I want to read you the exact quote from St. Irenaeus. Okay. Um, was made flesh for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit he made known through the prophets the plan of salvation, and the coming and the birth from a virgin, and the passion and the resurrection from the dead, and the bodily ascension into heaven of our beloved Jesus Christ our Lord, and his future appearing from heaven in the glory of the Father, to sum up all things and to raise anew all flesh of the whole human race. Okay, so that doesn't sound exactly like the Nicene Creed, does it? But do you hear elements of it? You hear elements of it? The expression, the articulation of the Trinity, the three persons of the Trinity. You hear the articulation of the, of the incarnation, that he became flesh, of a virgin. Right? That he was crucified, died, and was buried, and rose again on the third day. So I mean, you hear... You hear the, the, the sort of the skeleton of that, if you will. And so surely and clearly, this is an, art, an early articulation of what is going to become the formalized uh, formula at Nicaea. Okay. St. Irenaeus of Lyon. I don't know. In an Eastern liturgy? He wasn't a great writer, but what he wrote was I mean, he wasn't. Yeah, but he profound, know. profound theologian of the yeah. early church. Mm -hmm. Profound. Profound theologian. Very profound. Um, okay, so we've seen that. We've gone from the Didache to the Apostles' Creed, or we think probably is the early formula of the, the interrogatory of St. Hippolytus, to this rule of faith. Um, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, and then of course we get to uh, the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> Technically, uh, again, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, but you know, that's a mouthful, isn't it? So we just say the Nicene Creed. Uh, while the Apostles' Creed seems to have developed, it's, I think, I hope you've seen, I hope you've seen, it seems to have developed organically related to the sacrament of baptism. The Nicene Creed came about because of a very specific controversy in the early church, or in the 4th century church particularly, a disagreement in the church 
about uh, Christology, Christology. Let me tell y'all about my pronunciation of that because somebody did ask me this and I thought it was kind of funny. So um, this was after I'd done, I, I guess the two, the two sessions that I did on Marian dogmas, somebody said, well, I noticed that you pronounce it Christology. I was always told it was Christology. And I said, yes. And, and you know, it's that old potato, potato thing. But it was funny because I was immediately taken back to a graduate school classroom in which I had this, this crotchety old professor of patristics who was British and very British, very proper British, who said, it is Christology, not Christology. It is Christ, not Chris. <laughs> You will never pronounce it that way in my classroom. And you know, it's one of those things that as a young graduate student I was so intimidated by that it got embedded into my brain that way. So if you'd like me to say Christology, it's gonna take some work, but I will, I will, I'm up to the task. I will try. It's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, but um, but anyway, it was a Christological, Christological controversy. Uh, remember that that is a field of study that deals with the person and nature of Jesus Christ. So in the first century, there are lots of differing views of Christ's nature. We've talked about that in here before. Uh, lots of, uh, of uh, kind of out there ideas about it. So the immediate context for the Nicene Creed is a teaching so heretical, a teaching that was so threateningly divisive to the church uh, that a Roman emperor a Roman emperor, the first Christian Roman emperor, convened what we call the First Ecumenical Council. It's not the First Council. First Council is where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, right. It's not the First Council, but we call it the First Ecumenical Council. There are seven councils that meet between 325 and 787. Um, interestingly, beginning and ending at Nicaea. Uh, there are seven councils across those years that we call ecumenical because that's the time when the church was still one, when Eastern and Western Christians were still in unity with each other before the very tragic schism of 1054. So uh, when I say first ecumenical council, I'm talking about these the first of these seven. Okay. He convenes this first ecumenical council at Nicaea in, in that particular city in Asia Minor to settle this dispute. That's the whole reason a Roman emperor calls the council. But remember that Constantine was the first Christian Roman emperor. And although if, if you study his life and certainly if you read his biographers, you're going to get a lot of conflicting opinions about um, whether or not his conversion was sincere Okay? Uh, do y'all all kind of know the story of his conversion? Okay, that's okay. <laughs> What'd you say? No teacher. No teacher? No teacher. Okay. So, as the story goes, um, and this was um, during a, a time um, known as the Tetrarchy, when actually the Roman Empire had been divided into four kind of administrative units, each one ruled by a um, by a, te one, a tetrarch, one of four. And as administratively, it was a very bad idea. And so Constantine was in a struggle to get control uh, of the empire. And he won a, a major battle against the last of his rival tetrarchs, a man named Maxentius, in the year 312. It took place just outside of Rome at a place called Milvian Bridge. And according to the account given to us by his historian Eusebius of Caesarea, Constantine, from the night before battle, saw a vision of a cross of light in the sky uh, and a voice that said to him, by this sign you will conquer. Uh, this great, incredible vision that Constantine reported to Eusebius that he had had, and, and several others. So as it was, of course, the next day, he did um, succeed in... in uh, defeating the last rival, that last tetrarch of Maxentius, and he became sole emperor. So one of the things, of course, that he does immediately when he becomes sole emperor is citing this dramatic conversion experience he had, which truly sounds kind of like a road to Damascus kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 
um, that he made Christianity legal uh, in the Roman Empire. Now, he did not make it the official religion. It's a later emperor who does that. But he certainly allows Christianity to come out into the open. And he himself, as I said, converted to Christianity. I think the controversy about his conversion is not helped by the fact that he was not baptized until he was on his deathbed. Okay? But remember, again, in fairness to him, um, nobody had really worked out yet what baptism really meant. Does it remit all sins? Is it a remission of... The, the concept we have of original sin expressed in that language had not happened yet. That's St. Augustine who does that in the next century. So in, in his defense... I believe his conversion was sincere. He certainly sent his mother off to the Holy Land with a blank, with a blank check, right? Go find these sacred places uh, of, the, of the Holy Land. So my, my point of, of telling you all of that political background is that he has been heavily criticized, particularly in 20th and 21st century histories, as being politically motivated to call the Council of Nicaea that he didn't want Christianity to splinter because he didn't want to have to go back to war with any of, of these potentially rival uh, tetrarchs. The unity of the faith, no matter what his motivation, whether it was political or whether it was truly as a, as a, as a paternal kind of response as emperor of his people, the end result is the same. The end result is that there is an expression of a unified, common belief that can be shared across the church, that we still recite every Sunday in our feasts. So, does it matter what his motivation was? Has God not used other people who might not have had the best of motives? I can think of a few that are biblical, right? So, Whatever those motives are, doesn't matter. Here's the situation, though. There's a presbyter, and some call it, some sources call him a priest. Some say he was a bishop. I, it does not. I can't find any any indication that Arius was ever ordained as a bishop, but he was a priest for sure from Alexandria, Egypt. <clears throat> Arius, who was teaching that Jesus, <coughs> the Son of God, was not the same substance or same essence as God the Father. And in fact, not only was he not the same substance, that Jesus was a created being. So in other words, there was a time when Jesus did not exist. He was not co-eternal with the Father. Um, he was a created being, not the same being, a created being. So this heresy would have splintered the faith because do you understand that that's completely irreconcilable with a fully divine Jesus? It's completely irreconcilable. So it would have splintered the faith. Um, this council of over 300 bishops, and, and Constantine invited all the bishops of the empire, which would have been, uh, our, our guess is about 1,800 bishops, would have invited all the bishops of the empire, and we know that 300 came, approximately 300. St. Athanasius gives us a number of 318 that were there, like he counted them. So, and if you know anything about St. Athanasius, he probably did count them <laughs> and record it. So 318. So they gather in this place uh, in, called Nicaea, is near today, uh, from May uh, to August of 325 to debate the issue at hand of Arianism. The emperor presided uh, Pope Sylvester, Pope Saint Sylvester the first was not present, but he did send uh, emissaries to be there. And of course, the Pope endorsed and enforced the findings of the council, which is of course hugely important. Have any of you read the email that I sent out on Friday? I quoted from that eyewitness source. Any of you? Do any of you read those emails? <laughs> okay, good. That's good to know. Thank you. Because, um, you know, sometimes you send those missives out into the, you know, into the <laughs> ephemeral and you never, you never know if anybody's reading it or not. But, okay, so if, if you read that email, you'll know that I quoted this source, Eusebius of Caesarea, 
uh, Eusebius Pamphilius is his name, but we all call him Eusebius of Caesarea. Uh, I quoted him because he kept the record. You know, he wrote down everything that happened at Nicaea. And uh, he pointed out on his first day summary, of course, what was the most important thing. Does anybody remember what was the most important thing he concluded his observation with? The emperor provided plenty of food. <laughs> that was the most important thing he observed on that day. Uh, because, and it is important, because these 300 bishops who arrived in Nicaea were each given permission to bring two priests and two deacons with them. So there might have been as many as 2,000 people there, including, uh, not including, the pagans that Constantine permitted to come in and observe uh, the sessions. So we're talking about a huge group of people, so the food was important. And from Eusebius, we get this opening description as well, okay? Lest we forget that this is a completely human story in a human context, Eusebius gives us this opening description. Quote, the emperor entered as the heavenly messenger of God he is. <laughs> Did I mention that he's in the employee of the emperor? Okay. <laughs> the emperor entered as the heavenly messenger of God he is, clothed in raiment which glittered with rays of light. But respectfully and reverently seated the bishops before himself. Okay, he wants us to know how humble the emperor is, right? I sort of took away a laugh about that. <laughs> the proceedings at Nicaea are, are recorded in pretty good detail, therefore, although the major primary sources vary a little bit about what happened in its order. Um, we have a good history of it. While the major issue was Arianism, and that's the thing we always take away from First Council of Nicaea, is that it settled this dispute uh, by anathematizing Arianism, in other words, declaring it a false teaching, um, excommunicating Arius and some of his followers. We always think about that, and we think about the formulation of the, uh, of the creed. The council also dealt with some other issues that were interesting. It might be interesting to explore another time. Uh, it also suggested, for instance, that there would be a uniform rule for the dating of Easter. And we used the Nicene model for the dating of Easter. There was a great deal of diversity in the early church about when Easter was celebrated. And some, we had the idea that some areas, and this is particularly true in the British Isles, the further north you went in Gaul and across the channel into, into Britain, uh, they're celebrating uh, Easter uh, in the middle of the week. Uh, and actually, it's not called Easter yet. Well, it is in some places, but mostly the Feast of the Resurrection. And so there's a great deal of diversity, and the emperor's concerned about that. Because remember, what it means to be Catholic is to be in unity. And the more universal we can be, he felt like the, the, that was, was more important than, than putting aside local custom. So he suggested a model of calculating the date of Easter that would be, um, and remember we're using the Julian calendar, right, the Julian calendar, because you don't have the Gregorian calendar yet, that comes later. The Julian calendar, which um, his suggestion was that it should be, Easter should be observed on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox, okay? And for purposes of making it easy, <laughs> Um, the vernal equinox, what we call the ecclesiastical equinox, was fixed at March 21st. Even though the vernal equinox can happen between March 19th and March 21st. As a matter of fact, in the 20th century, the equinox has always, excuse me, 21st century, the equinox has always fallen on March 20th. It's on March 20th this year. Okay? But the ecclesiastical equinox is fixed at March 21st. Because he didn't want you to be confused about this. Okay. <laughs> so the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the vernal equinox fixed at March 21st. Well, that's all great and wonderful, and the church is able to apply that universally. Uh, we, have, we have a great record that that's being, for instance, um, observed almost everywhere. Finally, in Britain, adopts it in the 7th century. So what happens then to change the way that Western Christians and Eastern Christians observe Easter? The yeah. Gregorian calendar, yeah. which we adopted in the West and they did not. They still use the Julian calendar. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, this is why my Orthodox friends always get the Easter candy on sale. <laughs> Not on the same calendar. Um, but anyway, so, so that's, that's an interesting thing that came out of uh, Nicaea that we don't really ever talk about is this dating of Easter. Also, there's some very early emphasis on canon law, uh, the, the rudimentary, uh, I would say, uh, roots, if you will, of, of what becomes formalized canon law is also at Council of Nicaea. But we could do all of that some other time. Um, I digress. Squirrel. <laughs> it's like, okay, think about Easter. Um, so our Nicene Creed, uh, promulgated at Nicaea in 325, was finalized in 381 at the First Council of Constantinople. The discussion at Nicaea, no doubt, in, uh, engendered some disagreement. Remember this, and I use the word debate, and that's the word Eusebius uses, that there is a lively debate on the floor. The, the overwhelming majority of the bishops who were there, I think say four out of 318, according to St. Athanasius, all of them except four came with the idea that Arius must be anathematized. It was already kind of a, a foregone conclusion. How that creed would be worded still had to be worked out, and, uh, and St. Athanasius came very, very well prepared. He brought actually a model creed with him. Did y'all know this? He brought one with him that's about that long. Uh, that's still a beautiful historical document, the Creed of like, St. Athanasius. But um, I, I think probably everybody took one look at that and said, well, let's edit that down a little bit. <laughs> uh, but so there's this lively debate that goes on in disagreement. And I think some probably righteous anger directed at Arius. Um, when he rose to speak, uh, Eusebius says that he was basically shouted down. You know, and, and, and called everything from a heretic to probably much worse. And the man, the man is seen, of course, as somebody who's threatening the unity of the church, the unity of the faith. And there was no greater, greater sin for these men at Nicaea than to tear and divide the garment of Christ, which is essentially what they saw happening. So, Every year at Christmas, there are memes that circulate on social media. You know where this is going. There are memes that circulate on social media every Christmas of St. Nicholas of Myra. Uh, St. Nicholas, the St. Nicholas, right? The St. Nicholas, who becomes the prototype for Santa Claus. Um, that St. Nicholas. Indicating that he got so angry at the council that he punched Arius in the face. <laughs> While this might capture some of the emotional sentiment that might have been being expressed at Nicaea, it may not even be true. Okay? It may not even be true. Eusebius does not mention it in his history. Um, I think he would have said... Let me tell you about the fist fight on day 15. I think he would have mentioned that. But the fact that he doesn't, I don't think excludes the story, but I think it, it casts some credibility on it because um, the story doesn't appear in any of the immediate sources until uh, of the council at all. And it only really appears about a thousand years later. Um, in a medieval, like, 14th century chronicle, it's retold, retold as something everybody is supposed to know. Um, again, after the schism in Christianity, I think introduces a whole new, we, we need to have kind of a, a hermeneutic of suspicion about anything that's said about the East after the schism, meaning we need to look at that with, with a little more suspicion. But anyway, it does make a great story. While its history is dubious, we're, we're going to have some fun with it. I admit, I always tell the story to my students in history of Christianity classes just because it's something they can relate to. Oh, like a bra and a bar? Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly like that. Except the stakes are so much higher. Um, with the disclaimer that this might be a little bit uh, of an exaggeration, but I did pull some samples of this for you to see that circulate every Christmas on social media. So there's this one. Uh, slapping heretics since AD 325. Um, there, of course, you see 
uh, this St. Nicholas supposedly slapping areas. That's one version of it that circulates. There's another version that says, um, St. Nicholas of Myra, he knows when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake. And if you're a Christological heretic, he'll punch your lights out. And then there's this version. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you profess the consubstantiality of the Son with the Father. Right? And I suspect this one goes over a lot of people's heads at Christmas, right? <laughs> but you all get it. Because we're Catholics. <coughs> we say the creed. And we know the creed. So you, you absolutely get it. Uh, interestingly, this creed that was at the heart of unity in the early church is later going to become a subject of controversy, of course, in the lead up to the great schism between Eastern and Western churches that occurs in 1054. And those of you who have, have ever heard me speak about this know that I, this is something that makes me incredibly sad. This, um, this tear, I think, is the, the, the greatest tragedy in the history of Christianity. But what happened is that the creed as it was formulated in 325 that, that the bishops at Nicaea agreed upon, uh, in the third position, the third paragraph uh, about the Holy Spirit, it simply stated, I believe in the Holy Spirit. That's where it ended. When the Council of Constantinople met in 381, uh, it officially adopted an expanded version of that paragraph that is familiar to, to us. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. So what you might notice in the final version of the Nicene Constantinople Creed, there are three words that are not there. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. And what do we say? Mm -hmm. Proceeds from the Father and the Son. And the Son this notorious so-called filioque clause that was added to the creed in Western churches sometime in the ninth century um, during, it's actually the Emperor Charlemagne, it's during the, the time of this vast Carolingian Empire, this rebirth of the Roman Empire, where he extends influence into most of Western Europe as emperor. He... Um, promoted the addition of these words to the creed. Well, if, if anybody know what the immediate problem with this is? So churches of the East, remember by, by now, I mean, we've got the, uh, the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, right? The collapse of the Western Roman Empire, you have the Eastern Roman Empire living on with its center at Constantinople, incredible place of literacy and learning until 1453 when it finally fell to the Ottoman Turks. So do the Eastern bishops feel a little bit dissed about not being consulted? There, this, this addition to the creed was not done by an ecumenical council of the church. If you go to an Eastern Orthodox uh, divine liturgy, and you hear the, the creed recited, you will not hear those words. It ends with, proceeds from the Father. So there's a theological question that was at stake, and it is sadly one of the contributing factors to the Great Schism of 1054, mm -hmm. is the unilateral decision on the part of the Western Church to add the filioque clause to the creed. So is there a way to resolve that? That's beyond my pay grade and also beyond the scope <laughs> of what we're trying to do today, but... But I, I do, I do hope so one day that that will be, all will be healed. Well, it already is all healed, right? But I'd like to see that here. Okay, so absolutely, our creeds are public prayers, affirming what we believe. If you go back to that statement of the catechism, affirming what we believe in community, saying it aloud for others, directing it to God, is they're obviously public prayers. I believe. Lex Ronde, Lex Credendi.